Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 201, Kermit Zarley on Reformation, Part 2. Mr. Kermit Zarley was a successful professional golfer on the PGA Tour and the Champions Tour. His published books include Solving the Samaritan Riddle, Peter's Kingdom Keys Explain Early Spirit Baptism, The Gospels Interwoven, Palestine is Coming, The Revival of Ancient Philistia, The Third Day Bible Code, Warrior from Heaven, and The Restitution of Jesus Christ. This last book was initially promoted under the pseudonym Servetus the Evangelical. He blogs on golf, theology, the Bible, and current events at the Kermit Zarley blog on Patheos. In this episode, part two of my recent conversation with Mr. Zarley on the topic of Reformation. Kermit Zarley, welcome back to the Trinity's Podcast. Glad to be back with you, Dale. Last week, we were talking about reforming versus the Reformation and how it's a lot easier for Protestants to like the Reformation than to actually like current day reforming. And yet, I mean, look, who's to say that everything that needed to be done was done back in the mid-1500s? Yes. Most of us, in fact, think that it wasn't all done. Some of us don't believe in bishops, but Lutherans and Anglicans have bishops. We agree with the Anabaptists about that. Some of us believe in believer's baptism, and so we think the Calvinists are mistaken about that and the Anglicans. So then we think that further reforming was done after just Luther and Calvin, right? How do we know that God didn't leave some for the 21st century? Good question. Now, the thing that people will always say to us is, and I I know that you and I have both heard this in our theological friendly arguments that we have with people, they will say, surely, surely God would not let the church get off on such a wrong track on something so important like the nature of God. How could God possibly allow people to come up with these Trinity theories unless they're true? Unless this kind of speculation is just correct and uh, drawing out what's in Scripture, what do you think we should say to that kind of argument? That's a good question, Dale. I think there's a a bit of arrogancy in a statement like that. God made human beings with free will. He doesn't force his will upon people. Even the church can go astray. Look at the book of Romans, Romans 11. Paul warns us about this, that the church should not get arrogant. He says, uh, look what happened to Israel. Israel rejected Jesus. God sent Jesus to be the Messiah of Israel. How could God let his chosen people mess up like that? Yes. And so even in these church councils, The leaders of the church can go astray because they have a free will. God doesn't necessarily impose his will upon people. He guides them if they are willing to listen to him. Yeah. Jesus said, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. And so we need to always be doing that, seeking God's will and having a humility about it and trying to examine even our own beliefs with as much of an unbiased view as we can, to be as objective as we can. Men should be doing that when they meet together in church councils. When I um, get in discussions with atheists sometimes, Some atheists seem to have a lot of very strong convictions about what God would do if God were real. I met a guy once who had been brought up in a Christian house. This is when I was in graduate school, my master's degree. I met a guy who used to be a Christian, and now he was an atheist, and his stated reason for being an atheist was that his girlfriend broke up with him, and God would not have allowed such a terrible, painful thing as that. Well, that's that's kind of silly. I mean... (laughs) Who does he think he is? Like, 
you'd have to be as wise as God to know what things God would definitely not allow and definitely allow, right? I mean... Yeah, it's pretty shallow thinking. Just look around the world, look at history. All kinds of bad things happen all the time. Yeah. How does this guy come up with the idea that God has a duty to keep his girlfriend from breaking up with him? I mean, that's just kind of nutty. Like, why would God have to do that? Yes. Did he make you a promise that truly your girlfriend will never depart ye? I mean, it didn't happen. <laughs> so, But I'm glad that you brought up the case of Israel as well, because according to the Bible, God really did call Abraham and promise to bless his descendants. And then it's just, you know, basically a, a series of uh, terrible foul-ups, you know, the the chosen people just keeps messing up and then... God will send a prophet that says, you done messed up, Israel. Then most of the time they'll repent or some of them will be punished and other ones will be allowed to continue. I mean, there was even a point where they like lost God's law and like rediscovered it. And <laughs> how could God allow that to happen? This is his chosen people. I don't know. Free will? I mean, that's as good a thing as we could say. Just he lets us be free individually and he lets us be free collectively, but then collectively we can go astray. How did God let the Jews be divided into Sadducees, Pharisees, Zealots, Essenes, and so on? How, why did God allow that at the time of Jesus? I don't know. I mean, in some ways, we a lot of Christians would think that the Pharisees were kind of most on track out of all those different groups, the Herodians. At least the Pharisees were kind of conservative about believing Scripture and so on. But yeah, so this surely God would not let the church go astray. Look, it's just um, armchair speculation, you know, how can, how can you be sure about something like that? Yeah, it ignores history. Let's move forward in history from the Old Testament times and the time of Jesus. So people like us, people that are evangelical Protestants, just by definition, we believe that the following things were mistakes. Bishops, clerical celibacy, the idea that you can't be forgiven for any serious sin after baptism, worship of or prayer to the saints, the whole Pope idea, the Hail Mary prayer, confession as practiced by Roman Catholics, the whole practice of monks and nuns. We don't believe in that. Like we don't have that institution. We don't think it's something that was part of apostolic practice. It's, it's fine for there to be celibate people and, and unmarried people who serve God in their own way. But the particular institution of monks and nuns, a lot of Protestants would think that's taking too many good people out of society and out of the marriage pool. The Immaculate Conception of Mary, the perpetual virginity of Mary. These are mistakes, we think. One of the silliest mistakes is a uh, Josephite marriage, this idea, which is in medieval Catholic moral teaching, right? The idea is that Mary was too holy to have marital relations, but she was married to Joseph, obviously, so it must have been a special kind of celibate marriage, which they call a Josephite marriage. Well, you know, I don't recommend anybody try a Josephite marriage. I don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> uh, I think it's going to result in unhappiness. But look, I just rattled off a list of things that, let's say in the year 1516, if you were a Western European Christian, you would just think, well, all Christians believe in these things. But this would have been a mistake, right? Even if most of them or all of them believe these things, they could still be without scriptural foundation and or contrary to scripture and good sense. Yes. Here's a fun thing to imagine. We get in our time travel machine, and we go back, and we, uh, we learn German, and we go back to Martin Luther when he was an Augustinian monk, and we say to Martin Luther, hey, listen, son, you're getting some funny ideas here. Who do you think you are? Do you think that God would allow his true church to go astray on these things that you're starting to criticize? You need to not think so highly of yourself, friend. You need to back off because you can't put your little puny judgment against the judgment of God's true church. Would that be good advice or would that be terrible advice? We always need to self-examine our own selves as people. 
Well, the church needs to examine itself as an institution. Yeah, so, I mean, if we told Luther to not investigate these problems with the church as he found it in his day, I mean, we all, we all Protestants, we all think that that would be way too conservative. So, the article that you mentioned in last week's episode in Christianity Today used the phrase, time-honored teachings. You got to be careful because it's very easy to be too conservative with time-honored teachings. If our authority is really scripture and ultimately Jesus and the apostles, if that's our authority, then that's going to have to trump time-honored teachings in some cases, isn't it? Yeah. You know, in the history of the church, there have always been these reform movements at various different times, oftentimes a spiritual movement. And I think uh, that is a spirit that should be in the church all the time in the sense that we're always thinking that, well, we've got these traditions that have been passed down to us by the church. But are these traditions that the first Christians had? And so those are the traditions that we really want to follow, those beliefs and teachings of the very first Christians, because they were taught by Jesus. And Jesus is our Lord and our master teacher. And that's who we want to follow, not necessarily traditions of men that may not be traditions that were passed down by Jesus and his apostles and the Apostle Paul. When the Trinity's podcast returns, didn't Jesus promise that God's Spirit would lead his church into all truth? Now, what about the passage where Jesus talks about the spirit of truth and says that God's spirit will lead you into all truth? Is this an argument that, come on, we have to trust the mainstream, even the mainstream in the year 325, 381, or 451? What would we say to that? Well, of course, Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit there in the Gospel of John, and the spirit will guide you into all truth. That is something that we need to think about throughout our life. And the, the Spirit will guide us along the way if our hearts are right. But that's why we should always be examining our hearts. Yeah, that's right. And I think if you look at the New Testament, too, there were things that in Jesus' earthly ministry could not be practiced and could not be taught because he was an observant Jew. So were all of his disciples. So the further things about being led into truth, there were th- there are things that Paul teaches that Jesus could not teach because of just what time they were and what role they were playing in God's plan. But, I mean, God leading the disciples into all truth, I mean, don't we think that's what happened in Acts when they realized that people could enter the movement without becoming observant Jews? That was a huge deal right there. That was something Jesus was not going to tell you to to break the law. Uh, he came there to fulfill it and to see it out to its to its end purpose, really, which was the new covenant. But you can't read into that a promise that 300 years from now, a hierarchical elitist group of bishops is going to get together with the help of a Roman emperor and come up with what all Christians must believe. I mean, that's going a bit far from what Jesus says in that point in the Gospel of John. Yes, the emperor did call the first ecumenical council, the Catholic Church calls it. That was because there was this turmoil in his empire. Christians were arguing about who 
was Jesus? And did Jesus pre-exist? Was he an actual person who pre-existed as the Logos? Right. As the Son of God? Or was he a lesser being, like Origen taught? Was he a lesser being, or was he a being that had the divine essence? Yes. Athanasius insists. So they had these different views of what they called the Logos Son that pre-existed Jesus. And Arius said there was a time when the Logos Son did not exist. But along came the bishop of Alexandria. His name was Alexander, and he said Arius was wrong. The Logos Son was eternal. There never was a time when the Logos Son did not exist. So this was the beginning of the Arian controversy, and it uh, started to spread, this argument, throughout the Roman Empire. And uh, Emperor Constantine, who had become a Christian, he called this council for them to resolve the matter. And he applied imperial pressure on these 318 bishops to solve this by drafting a creed. So this is something that Christians should be aware of, that the emperor pressured the church leaders to solve it with a creed. Was that the right thing to do? Yeah, he wasn't the last one. Later emperors followed his footsteps and uh, tried to force a number of creeds onto bishops. And finally, Theodosius I, in the year 381, forced one and it stuck. And so that's the Nicene Creed, the fully developed Constantinopolitan Creed that's recited in churches today that was slammed onto the table by Theodosius and the council that he hosted in his capital city of Constantinople in 381. Yeah. So yeah, this should give us pause. I mean, divine providence, yes, can work through a Persian emperor or a Roman emperor. God's all-powerful and all-knowing, so he can make good out of any situation. But there's something that I think you could call a providential fallacy here. I think you have to be careful to avoid this, which is saying that just because something happened, therefore, that was what God always meant to happen. Unless you're an Augustinian slash Calvinist and you think that God just plans out every single detail of everything that ever happens and then just enacts it single-handedly, which is a very extreme fatalistic kind of view, if you think that God in any way manages things and lets us have free will also, then just because something happened, you can't infer that God meant it to happen. All you can infer is that he allowed it. But then, you know, he could have a lot of reasons to allow things that he's not fully approving of. A lot of reasons. Say you're raising a kid and your kid, I don't know, it's a guy, and your kid, he gets an earring. And someone says, uh, why did you make your kid get an earring? Like, well, I didn't make my kid get an earring, but I decided that it would be better to allow it than to prevent it. Maybe I have my reasons. I'm picking my battles or something. Or I want him to find out if it's a good idea or who knows. There could, there could be all kinds of reasons, right? But uh, what I allow is not the same as what I do. So what every Christian must agree is that God allowed... Catholic orthodoxy and Catholic institutions to arise. And I don't know exactly why. Maybe it was better than some of the alternatives. Maybe some of it just comes down to free choices. Right? We don't want to be fatalistic and just think that everything that happens was meant to happen and could never have been prevented. Things just couldn't turn out in any different way. Well, if you study history and you look at the state of the argument, say in the year 360, Nobody would have thought that it was going to come out the way that it came out in 381. I mean, on the face of it, there are contingencies of history here. Things happen the way they did, but if God could miraculously rewind things to the year 300, who knows that they would all play out in the same way again. Now, the thing about emperors and about hierarchical churches of bishops and so on is they can try to enforce conformity and with enough time and enough power, they can enforce a lot of conformity. But the conformity that they can enforce directly is conformity of words. And that's what a creed is. It's these are words that you must say that you agree with. 
these are words that you must use in liturgical settings and so on. But the problem with this is they can't directly control thoughts. And then people attach different thoughts to the same words. And so when you just look at the level of words, you get yourself into thinking, well, Christians have just always been Trinitarians. Well, okay, at least since the 300s. But like, come on. I mean, even if this consensus took a long time, isn't it a universal consensus or nearly universal consensus? Because look, we're all using the Nicene Creed, the revised Nicene Creed of 381. Isn't that just a consensus that a Christian just can't disagree with? But at the level of ideas, there's still a clash there. So, and we talked a little bit about this last week, and it's in various places you can read that I've written, such as a couple of chapters in my book, What is the Trinity? Or in my Trinity entry in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Some Trinitarians think that the persons of the Trinity really are persons. They think that there are three selves and that they live together like three friends, three buddies, three amigos. Eternally, you've got these three amigos enjoying this wonderful communion. It's like a dance. It's like a family. Other Trinitarians say, no, no, these are all terrible analogies, terrible metaphors. Really, these are like modes of being. And so the persons of the Trinity aren't like persons in the modern sense. The persons of the Trinity are just three ways that God eternally lives God's life. Okay, but that's a big disagreement I just said there. Some of them think the one God is like a family. It's like a group. And the other ones think the one God is just like one single person with multiple personalities or something like that. And then there are people who say, actually, it's a complete mystery. God is one in one sense and three in another sense. And if you ask me what senses, I just don't know. Human language is inadequate. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to speak about things I can't understand. Okay, so I just sketched out very briefly what I have called a one-self Trinity theory, a three-self Trinity theory, and a Mysterian Trinitarian. And they can't all be correct. So why did God allow the one true church, however you want to define that, why did God allow his church to go so astray so that there's still, 2,000 years later, after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, why is there still disagreement among totally serious theologians and scholars about what the Trinity doctrine even means. Well, it seems like it's because these are our speculations and God just gives us the freedom to plow our own row and <laughs> go in that direction. He's not going to grab us and stop us. And so some think God is a self, some think God is a group, some think that God is a something we know not what. So, I mean, if real consensus, you know, consensus of thought is what we're hoping for, I mean, God just hasn't given us that. We should all be able to agree on that. What there is, is a tradition of enforcing certain language. And, well, you know, not everybody really agrees with that because we're Christians and we don't agree with it. When the Trinity's podcast returns... Mr. Kermit Zarley fact-checks some flaky theology using scripture. So back to your article, Mr. Zarley, you talk about fact-checking flaky theology using the Bible. Here is a statement that we hear from all Catholic traditions, small c Catholic traditions, that Jesus is God the Son, and furthermore, that Jesus is the eternal Son. So how can we evaluate those in light of the Bible? Well, first of all, the Bible does not say Jesus is God the Son. That is a, an imposition that the Catholic Church has put on the Bible, and Protestants have accepted it, and of course, it is an element of the doctrine of the Trinity. 
God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. As far as Jesus being eternal, my view on that, if we look at the Gospel of John, uh, it starts out and it says, In the beginning was the Word. You know, the New Testament came down to us in Greek. Mm -hmm. And that is the translation of the word logos. So in the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. Well, I don't think that that is the best translation, that third clause. I believe the English Bible has it right, the New English Bible. What God was, the Word was. That doesn't say that the Logos was God. And then we look at the verse 14. And the Logos took flesh, and that was Jesus. So there's a correlation in the beginning of the Gospel of John between the Logos and the man Jesus. But what is this Logos? Well, I don't believe the Logos is an actual person. I said before that the Spirit of God, I think, is like the Spirit of man because man is made in God's image. And just as man has a spirit, man has his word. What is his word? It's his expression of his mind. Hmm. That's what I believe is the Logos in the New Testament. The Logos, the Word of God, that is the expression of God, the expression of God's mind. So it's not an actual person, just like the wisdom of God is not an actual person. All Christians would agree to that. But the Spirit of God and the Logos, the Word of God, are much like the wisdom of God. And so it's not an actual person. So Right, but it's being personified. It's personified, that's right. The author right. expects us to remember Proverbs 8, where Lady Wisdom is there helping God create somehow, but that's not a real lady or some yes. kind of goddess or something. It's just it's divine wisdom being spoken of in a poetic way. Yeah, I think he also, the author expects us to know about Psalm 33, 6, which says, By Yahweh's word, the heavens were made, by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. Here, at the start of the chapter, he says, all things were made through this word. Nothing was made unless it was made by the word. Yeah, and that's what we see in the first chapter of Genesis. God speaks, mm -hmm. let there be light, and there was light. And so... God is creating through the expression of his word, which is the expression of his mind. And so the word, the Logos, took flesh and became Jesus, but Jesus didn't pre-exist as an actual person. The Logos wasn't an actual person. And so when we talk about Jesus being pre-existing eternally, I don't think that's biblical. But now it says the word became flesh in verse 14. I mean, what could that mean unless it's talking about an eternal spirit coming to have a body? Like we can understand that, like a spirit getting a body or, you know, assuming a human nature in the later terminology. So what could that mean then if, if it doesn't mean that? Well, there certainly is a mystery to it. In, in the history of the church, there's been an awful lot of questions asked about how the Logos relates to Jesus. And I don't necessarily think that we can come to the right answers all the time about all of these questions that we could ask. King David had something to say about that. You know, he, he's satisfied with only those things that God reveals to him. Well, there's lots of things that God has not revealed to human beings. And so I think we have to be content with the written revelation that God has given us, which is the Bible, and not go beyond it. So in my view of looking at verse 14 in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, I accept that it means that the Logos, the Word of God, took flesh, and 
the result was Jesus, and I'm willing to just accept that and not go into speculation of all of these questions that we could ask about it. I think that we can understand this way of speaking from other cases. To say that the word become flesh, right, that we've been told what word this is, and it's not, it's not been explained as an eternal spirit that coexists with God and is equally divine. It's, it's God's word by which he created. It's, it's like a divine attribute or divine action. I've given this analogy before. Imagine, uh, you know, Monticello that Je- Jefferson built. It was like his yes. dream home. It's still there in Virginia. You can see it. He, I guess, spent a lot of time designing it. You could say his dream home became brick and mortar and wood and shingles and so on. His dream became wood, you could say, or his dream became a dream home. It's that this plan was manifested by this physical object. The object was the expression of the plan. And we understand Mm -hmm. this. It doesn't involve some mystical transformation It's just that his plans were expressed by this entity that you see sitting in front of you. And so here, the observable entity is a man. It's Jesus, who in this gospel is explicitly called an anthropos, a man. And uh, the word becomes flesh is like God's eternal plan or thought or wisdom gets expressed in this man. In Jesus, this word dwells among us so that we can you know, learn more about God than we knew before, basically. Uh, You don't see God the Son in Scripture anywhere, and arguably, you know, the word that was with God isn't an additional God. It's not God the Son versus God the Father. It's just in the beginning was the Word of God. The Word of God was with God, whose Word He was, and the translation you suggested was, and the Word was what God was. So... In other words, it's a divine word or it's not, it's not somebody else. It's just God's word. And it was through this word that he made all things. And then there, the passage gets complicated in the middle part, I think. But it makes sense to then think that this eternal thought, you could say, was expressed by this man that walked among us. Seems good. Makes sense. Yeah. He was the revelation of God to us. The ultimate revelation. Yeah. The revealer. Yep. That's what the Gospel of John is about. Jesus reveals God. Jesus was not God. You know, the battleground of this teaching about Jesus being God, and when you look at all of Scripture, over half of it is in the Gospel of John. Mm. And I think that the Gospel of John has been quite misunderstood on this subject. The Gospel of John does not teach, in my opinion, it does not teach that Jesus is God. You have both conservative Christians, Catholic, Protestant, Evangelical, all kinds of them, and the higher critics, the critical scholars who are liberal, and all of them believe that the Gospel of John says Jesus is God. Of course, the critical scholars, the historical critical scholars, most of them think it's wrong. It teaches that Jesus is God, but it's wrong. Whereas all the other Christians, they believe, you're right, it does teach that Jesus is God, but it's right. And I think they're both wrong about that. The Gospel of John does not teach that. It does not say that Jesus is God. It's a mis- misunderstanding. Jesus is the revealer of God. Right, yeah. I would be careful. I mean, I wouldn't say that all scholars say that the Gospel says that Jesus is God. You're right that quite a lot do, and even liberals and, and unbelievers often will read it. You'll see Bart Ehrman read it that way. Um, yeah. But I think Bart Ehrman's mistaken, and there are careful readers who don't make that inference. Here's something that uh, I've found a number of scholars discussing, and I'll bet you have read some of these same people uh, in your book, The Restitution of Jesus Christ. I bet, I bet this is in, in there and in the footnotes more than once. The gospel, according to John, sharply distinguishes Jesus from God. Jesus is serving God. Jesus is praying to God. The Father is Jesus' is God. It's his father and his God. Jesus says that, don't believe me if I give testimony for myself, but there's this other one. There's someone else that testifies for me. 
That's God. <laughs> yeah. And whenever people pop up and say, well, you're calling yourself God and you're making yourself equal to God, he refutes them. And it's clear they're misunderstanding him. So what some evangelicals will do is they'll say, you know, you're right. It does, it does distinguish Jesus from God. But, you know, in effect, what the author is saying is that Jesus is God and Jesus isn't God. So it's a paradox. <laughs> yeah, I don't buy that. And you're right, Dale, when I said all scholars. I mean, I mean that most scholars. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there, are, there are careful scholars, most certainly, that don't say that. Yeah. But, but the reason you laughed just now is that it's very uncharitable to interpret an author as just blatantly contradicting himself the whole way through. Yes. I'd be pretty angry if somebody re read my article, you know, and... <laughs> Stupid idiot Dale, he's saying P here and not P there, and then he says P here and then not P there. <laughs> I'm maybe not the smartest guy, but I'm not that stupid. You need to try a little harder, you know. So if Jesus says before Abraham was, I am, all right, is he saying I'm God? Because that would clash with all the places where he distinguishes himself from God. You know, my father is greater than I. That's another one. Is he saying that I am God, or is he saying before Abraham was, I am he? I am the one. In other words, I am the Messiah. Because that's the thesis statement of the book, right? These things are written so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Yeah, I think the Gospel of John is the most well-crafted book in the Bible. And I think that Church Father John Chrysostom was right when he called it the spiritual gospel, because it often happens in the gospel of John. It happens in the synoptic gospels too, but not as much as in the gospel of John, that Jesus says something and he's misunderstood by his listeners, thinking that he means it literally. Like he says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Hmm. And Nicodemus thinks he means, what? You think I, have, I need to go back and have a physical birth again? No, yeah. that's not what Jesus means. Right. He means you need to be born from above. You need to be born again of the Spirit of God. That is a spiritual birth. And that happens many times in the Gospel of John. So some of these cases where people say, oh, Jesus is claiming to be God here. No, you're not understanding that Jesus is speaking spiritually. And just like twice, he's accused of claiming to be God or claiming to be equal with God in John 5 and 10. But Trinitarians overlook, I think, Jesus' response, which is a rebuttal, mm. a strong rebuttal of that allegation. That's right. He clarifies that he wasn't saying that he's God. In chapter 10, he, he clarifies that he was saying he's the son of God. Yes. His argument is he can't possibly be blaspheming because even these earlier people who were less great than he, because he's the Messiah, even these earlier people were called gods by scripture. So if I call myself son of God, that just can't possibly be blasphemous. So he destroys their argument <laughs> and he corrects yeah. them. He runs circles around his opponents. But I don't know, like we, we act like Jesus isn't smart. We, can, we think we can just get the point of the story without paying careful attention to what his actual points are. Yeah, I think that most Christians believe Jesus is God because the Bible says he's the son of God. And they have this reasoning that if God has a son, just like a man has a son, and that man's son grows up and becomes a man, then God's son must also be God, just like he is. Mm. And that is metaphysical reasoning that is incorrect. The Bible teaches about this Son of God concept and applies it to men, to angels, mm -hmm. to the King of Israel in the Old Testament. And so those obviously are not to be understood literally literally. 
They're to be understood relationally. And that's what it means for Jesus to be the Son of God. He has this extraordinary relationship with God. And that's why God declares at his baptism and at the transfiguration, this voice speaks from heaven and says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He's well pleased because of the way that Jesus is living his life. And Mm -hmm. Jesus is related to God Mm -hmm. because of it. That's right. And you know, what's entered into Catholic tradition are the speculations of Athanasius in the fourth century who says, hey, Jesus has got to be a true son, not a phony baloney son, so therefore he must share the nature of God. Well, what's this true son stuff? You know, son of God is a seemingly interchangeable term with Messiah in the New Testament. I think it is. The Messiah doesn't have to share God's very essential nature. There's, there aren't those metaphysical points being made in the actual texts. And yes. so, you know, let's be careful saying that this is obvious and that a purely human son of God is just a phony third rate kind of thing. <laughs> That's not the New Testament view. Right. When the Trinity's podcast returns, what's holding back further Reformation now? So we started off our conversation last week talking about Martin Luther. And, you know, there are some points in his life that are really very inspiring. You know, the guy is literally running for his life from the authorities. And it's all because of his attempts to be faithful to God, to to respond to the word of God. And when it contradicts human authorities, then he says, you know, roughly what the apostle said to the Jewish high council, which is, sorry but I have to obey God rather than men. So I'm not going to disown my books. I'm not going to stop teaching these things. And so he's a real model of being a good Berean and a courageous disciple who's willing to trust God and follow the teaching where it goes, even at great personal danger. But even though I see people celebrating Luther, and of course we also have to admit his dark side as well, but That's not what we're talking about today, interesting though that is. Even though we enjoy celebrating Luther and people like Luther, who took a courageous stand, we don't find a lot of people who are willing to be Luthers here and now, or even be open-minded about whether you could become such a person. So what factors, Mr. Zarley, do you think are holding back Reformation continuing here and now? Like, why don't we see even more reforming going on, even a theologically deeper return to clear and explicit New Testament teaching that the one God is the Father. Well, I do think that Martin Luther, you know, the the Middle Ages are coming to an end. It had been a, uh, a dark time, in a sense, with how the Roman Catholic Church was with some of these things like indulgences. And so Martin Luther was a You know, he was a fresh light. He brought reform that didn't necessarily happen that much to the Roman Catholic Church, but started another church, and it was a courageous thing that he did. How can this happen some more in the future? I'm not sure that I have much to say about that. But you did ask the question, what about this Trinity teaching, and can the view that we hold that God is only the Father, can that become more prominent and be believed more by by the church, by Christians? I don't know, Dale. I do believe that this movement now that's going on, uh, you've referred to it as biblical Unitarianism, it's different from 
the previous Unitarianism. I have a blog, and sometimes on my blog, when I uh, post about this subject, people will say, that's been tried before, and it didn't work, meaning the Unitarian view. Right. Well, there are some weaknesses in Unitarianism in history. One thing was that they were not firm on atonement. That is an important thing for me. Jesus died for our sins, and we need to believe that in order to be saved, in order for God to forgive us of our sins. That was not clear among Unitarians. They did have the truth that God's oneness means that he's a single personality, and that is the Father. They were right about that. Also, when it came to arguing about the critical text in the New Testament that Trinitarians cite the most in support of their Trinity view, sometimes I don't think Trinitarians were very good at arguing that. But I think the the biblical Unitarians today, they have it together quite a bit. Mm. And so the, the answers that they are giving to these critical texts like John 1.1c, John 20.28, where Thomas saw Jesus, the risen Jesus, and he said, my Lord and my God, was Thomas calling Jesus God? Mm -hmm. Biblical Unitarians uh, are giving better answers for these kinds of texts. Mm -hmm. Or let's just take the many Theos texts in the New Testament, in which if you look at various English Bibles, you will find that one Bible says that that text says Jesus is God, but you look in another English Bible, and it reads such that it doesn't say Jesus is God. For example, Romans 9, 5, Titus 2, 13, and 1 Thessalonians, is it 1, 12? Or and uh, Second Peter one one. Anyway, these are grammatical problems. Or First John five twenty. Right. Uh, there's a, there's a grammatical problem there, and that's why the versions, the English versions, are treating it differently. And so that became very alarming to me when I first began to investigate this. And I noticed that a lot of the main texts that Trinitarians cite to prove their viewpoint, there are grammatical difficulties that it's unusual to read the Bible and encounter a grammatical difficulty like this. And so I think that that's something that biblical Unitarians are answering with truthfulness and persuasiveness In the future, I think that the so-called biblical Unitarian movement is going to grow because they have a very strong, compelling viewpoint that they are presenting. And it's a very simple viewpoint. And it is a biblical viewpoint, which is that God is a single person. That's what the Old Testament says. That's what Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 6 says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Jews say that word, the Hebrew word ekad, means one, single. God is a single person. And the biblical Unitarians are proclaiming that, and they're doing it in a convincing and compelling way, and they believe very strongly that Jesus provided atonement on the cross. So I think the the movement in the future will just continue to grow. As to how much will it grow, how much will they convince Trinitarian Christians to change, I don't know. You raised two big topics there. The why did this fail before? Doesn't that show there was something terribly mistaken? And the what about the future? I agree with you in being optimistic about the future. We have something that Luther had, which is, well, truth on our side. And also 
more access to communication. We can get our yeah. message out to the whole world and it's happening now. And there's also an explosion of knowledge about the Bible. You mentioned these difficult translation problems. Well, people can just fire up their Bible program or they can get a good study Bible and just simply have these things explained, or they can dial up 20 different translations on a website. And so even a person that's only been to the eighth grade can look some of these things up now and not be fooled by, or just simply take the translator's word for it uncritically. Um, so all this knowledge is going out and, and people are starting to ask questions the subject about why did biblical Unitarianism of the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, why did those movements fail, which they did for the most part? You mentioned atonement. Oh boy, they, but they had all kinds of problems. You know, they, some of them stopped evangelizing, some of them stopped baptizing, some of them didn't believe in miracles, some of them started to speculate that all religions are one. I mean... Some became universalists. There are so many problems there. It's a big subject, but um, they didn't fail just by being Unitarian. And you know how we know this? Because early Christianity did really great, and it was Unitarian. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, right. In the 200s, there was not a single anybody going around talking about a triune God. Now, they are starting to speculate about the Logos, some of them, but others not. But anyway, they were, so to speak, conquering the world. I mean, they were effectively evangelizing and reproducing. They were a successful, spirit-filled movement, and they didn't have the Trinity. So we know it works, Unitarian Christianity, because it worked before the late 300s. And, you know, there have been times and places where it has worked well since, where there have been thriving communities of Christians that were not Trinitarians. Some of the Congregationalists in early America were that way. Yeah. The Socinians, the minor Reformed Church of Poland was that way. Some Unitarians in England, Scotland, places like that. But, you know, I think when you look at the actual theological and biblical arguments in, say, especially the 1800s, the Unitarians usually just sweep those. I mean... They're running argumentative circles around the Trinitarians in most cases. I mean, they were the first ones out of the gate that pointed out that First John 5, 7 is not a genuine text. I mean, they pointed out all kinds of things which careful biblical scholars now pretty much just agree with. They undid a lot of the Trinitarian interpretations of reading later ideas back into Scripture but I think the movements of American and British Unitarianism, I think they failed for reasons not directly having to do with the Trinity and Incarnation. I think they had other problems, like they could only appeal to the upper class, and they tended to say that religion was all just about ethics, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, good points. The question is, are we going to fail? <laughs> yeah. Let's not. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not only undo Catholic errors of theology, but let's actually live the kingdom of God and, you know, live out and believe the whole gospel message and not just the, the theological bits, but let's be good disciples. Amen. Mr. Zarley, thanks for talking with us. I enjoyed it very much, Dale. Today's thinking music has been a public domain version of A Mighty Fortress Is Our God. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode where you can listen to and download that entire track. Well, I put it up to a vote whether or not to keep or discard my traditional intro and outro, and more people by far voted to put it back in. So, you noticed at the start of today's podcast I did that and it'll be at the end of the podcast as well partly people are used to it and partly people like the tagline do you love God enough to think about it of course you have to do more than that you have to also love him enough to obey him <laughs>
and you have to love him enough to follow his son, come hell or high water. I am thinking about a few other changes, so keep a lookout for those. I'll post about those in the Trinity's Podcast Facebook group. listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.